I want to thank uh, Professor Chen and my good friend Xu Guoqi for inviting me here. This is uh, very valuable for me uh, to be here and also to reconnect with good old friends like Devin or Bill Kirby. So it's really a big pleasure. What I'm going to do um, today is, um, is actually quite the opposite to Devin's paper. It's uh, really very theoretical or not, not very theoretical, but rather theoretical and rather historiographical. That's also why I apologize. I don't have any slides and thank you so much Hilson and Bass for the help and also for preparing this slide. What I'm going to talk um, about is, as it said here, rethinking under Mao. And I want to think about how we can understand what happened in the 1950s in China, but not only in the 1950s, but by way of implication. I think I'm interested in explaining what how we uh, can understand the People's Republic of China and all its, I'd say, triumphs and failures. A and so I start, my paper has two sections. I start with an historiographical section where I think about how did we so far try to understand PRC China. And I want to identify three narratives. And then I want to go on and propose another way of looking at the PRC by assembling parts from earlier writings of Hannah Arendt and Karl Schmidt, uh, two Germans who were very interested, interested in totalitarian systems and tried to explain them. I'm not trying to resurrect or save totali totalitarianism here, but I think some elements of what they have put forward can be very helpful in understanding uh, China or PRC China. Let's start with the historiographical section. Um, it's interesting to note that although enrollments in history programs have really declined, I think, worldwide, in Chinese history programs, declined worldwide, uh, we can also notice that history is, receives more attention than ever before. To judge from both the bestseller lists on Amazon, where you find a lot of history titles, even related to China, which wasn't the case like 30 years ago, and we, which we can also judge from the role history is normally given in this huge combat known as systemic rivalry between China and the West. So in this, in this discussions on how this, to this rivalry between China and the West, history plays actually a very big role in almost all the publications, mostly implicitly. But there are mostly there are historical arguments hidden behind it. So we are, in many ways, saturated in history and also Chinese history arguments in our public discussions. But what purpose, purpose does this history really serve? And I think that's far less clear. Academic specialists and the general public alike seem more confused than ever by this question at any time in recent history. What do we need this history for, or what can it really explain. History in China and in the West had always many purposes. I mean, the, the beginnings of history writing uh, were related to the fact that, that there was a need for moral education to identify the good people and the bad people and to make it clear. And then so readers could learn from bad examples and good examples what is actually how they can learn from history, of course. Or equally, Important was, of course, the establishment of legitimate title or legitimacy in the first place, including especially emperors in China and elsewhere who claimed the right to rule by looking into history, by constructing a descent line of predecessors stretching back into the mist of time. And then, of course, the great religions were always also interested in history to teach the religious or awe of religious power and tradition and to reveal the providence behind it. So these were clear purposes why history was written. Moral education, establishing legitimacy, and of course, revealing religious truth. But then in Europe during the Enlightenment, um, a vision of history emerged that at least partially eclipsed these older ones. And it became the history that we actually 
now understand as history, as a professional academic or scientific discipline. And in this vision, actually, which relates to what Bill yesterday said about the Humboldtian University, because it was really part and parcel of the Humboldtian idea of the university, history became a discipline like social sciences, and the study of history should and could reveal regular, predictable laws that govern the development of all human societies and therefore could help us understand not only the past, but the present and the future as well. Now, two examples, and then we come to the first master narrative already that, imply that has an impact on how we think about China. Two examples are Hegel and Marx, who clearly thought that you could identify patterns in history that tell you how human society will develop. So in a similar fashion, Marxist historians writing about China in China as well as outside of China followed this line of thinking. And the Marxist narrative is one of my first master narrative became the official credo, of course, not only of all communist regimes, but also, of course, of the writing of Marxist history. So it was believed then that communism was an ideal condition where Chinese people would not only enjoy material abundance, but would also live in a most perfect democracy, harmonious, self-regulating, with no man subordinate to another. It was imagined as a rational system and would come about as the result of the laws of historical development. This story, of course, was not only the centerpiece of Mao Zedong and Marxist thinking till today in China, but also numerous Western historians have written in this line about China. We forget this now. In this age of rivalry, we forget that there was a very strong Marxist tradition in writing about China. Of course, it's stronger, it's stronger and very valid in China today but was also very popular uh, in the West. So that's, of course, we have discarded this history now, or this narrative here, whatever the West is. But there's a second narrative that's also connected to this scientific approach to history, and we might call this the modernization story, in which the CCP was not so much driven by idealistic or by ideals of communism, but were technically minded modernizers committed to developing a poor and backward China, though undoubtedly and uh, regrettably violent in the early stages, inevitable given the, the tradition of war, the context of war, the CCP eventually abjured extreme repression. And so some scholars have then noticed or noted, argued, that the violent excesses of the regime have to be balanced against the undeniable achievements. And I think one of the names that we can mention here is Elizabeth Perry from Harvard, who has maintained it was during the height of Chinese authoritarianism, the Maoist era, that the foundations of contemporary growth were laid in many ways, for instance, institu in, in, in respect to institutions. And there are also numerous other examples. But also this narrative, which was very popular uh, for a long time has taken a hit. We live now in an age where, in the words of a recent book by Enzo Traverso, the past no longer announces the future. It no longer contains any promise of redemption. Even Marxist scholars, in China as well as outside of China, for all their continued belief in the importance of class, no longer have any confidence that the history of class struggle points toward the ultimate victory of the proletariat and the establishment of a more just society. And not even Marxists in China seem to be confident that true communism will ever be realized in China. But this also applies to the proponents of the modernization narrative, who, after communism's collapse, read Francis Fukuyama, you know, the end of history, and hoped that the history had reached an end point of sorts at least to the extent that societies around the world, including China, were embracing a Western model, not only a Western model of capitalism, but also a moderate democracy. And they have seen, I think, their dreams turn to nightmares. So there's a lot of disillusionment and dis disappointment in our field if we, are, if we really look at it, especially when we talk about writing a history that has anything to say about the present and the future. Today, therefore, very few historians in the first place will try to deduce 
anything from their often fragmentary and difficult source materials or, or even to predict the future, which you can of course argue is perhaps not the job of the historian. But even more, ever more narrow topics and ever higher degree of specializations often mean that in many historical works, China disappears as a whole, disappears behind the horizon. If any group of contemporary historians is forecasting what is to come in any convincing manner, it's interestingly, it's climate scientists who try, by looking at past data, try to project something in the future. And if a specter is haunting the world today, it is, of course, all to the all too real risk of ecological doom. So what has the fall of this academic or scientific history left us with in the field of Chinese history? I think in Europe, at least I can say in the United States, in recent years, the most forceful answer has come initially from, I would say, let's call it forms of leftist thinking and forms of post-colonialism and also from feminism. History, many of its most prominent practitioners these days insist, has the power to expose the deep structures of injustice and repression and inequality and discrimination, both in Europe and the United States. But it's increasingly, we can see effects of this uh, in the, the writing of history about China. So this tendency uh, leads me to my third narrative, uh, the last one, repression narrative, which portrays the PRC as an, as an all-powerful state apparatus that coerced the citizens into willful obedience and acceptance of the new order. And I think I can cut that short. You know all these writings, perhaps, where in books where Mao is portrayed as a madman or a monster, or where the mass crimes and mass murder that undeniably happened uh, become uh, most the most uh, attention. So this sort of history, China as a repressive, as a brutal, as a violent country, this sort of history can serve an obvious purpose, but it has its limits. <coughs> and it is necessary to say, to, to make that clear, it is absolutely necessary to reveal these crimes because they have happened, that's undeniably true. But despite the relief of seeing hypocrisy and brutality exposed and unexpected connections made, what readers above all glean from works written along these lines is a dark message. How awful the past in China was and how difficult, and that's, I think, the most more important part, and how difficult, if not impossible, it for China is to overcome or escape this past. So the idea here is that history in this way has become a sort of a moralizing discourse that holds the past itself morally culpable. But I think the practice of history has to offer more than just the grim necessity of exposing how thoroughly the past traps China within invisible or too visible prison walls. Put simply, this history writing is not going to fill the gap um, left by the fall of the academic or scientific history. And I would like to mention uh, two more before I go on to the next part of the paper. I would like to mention a few more tendencies that have sort of really changed the history field. There's above all the subjectivist turn let's call it this, that has an immense impact. For instance, see that um, I think it can be led back to uh, work about the Holocaust, where, for instance, a filmmaker, Claude Lanzmann, um, in his film Showa, insisted that certain things, like the Holocaust, I mean, he only talked about the Holocaust, could not be explained or interpreted, simply narrated. So one part of this subjectivist turn is to turn to narrative history where also, interestingly, the eye of the author plays a very, very big role. So while scientific or the earlier academic history generally embraced an overall narrative of progress and modernization, this necessary, again necessary, historical work on the Holocaust and other genocides and incidents of mass murder tore that narrative, of course, apart for a reason. And then there's the intellectual movement collectively known as postmodernism, which challenged all so-called meta-narratives as mere projections onto subject matter, 
So these meta-narratives of modernity were broken. And then, of course, there is this turn to individualism and singularism, which makes it harder to generalize about communities or societies. So while tempting historians to retreat to even smaller and individual spheres. So this is all necessary work, perhaps. But I, s I want to point out that when it comes to China, uh, we can probably not afford um, to leave the whole um, just uh, unobserved or to refuse to ask questions to the whole of China because in the end what we can see here across the border is that that thing, China, really exists. So that's why I started to think about how can we frame a different perspective that avoids these three master narratives, the repression narrative, the modernization narrative, and of course the Marxist narrative. And I thought it would be useful to go back to people like Hannah Arendt or Carl Schmitt who lived or experienced similar, I don't say identical, I say similar phenomenon in their time, especially in Soviet Russia, as well as in Nazi Germany. There's much to learn for them for a new approach of PRC, although I would not completely transport them to use for China because they were very specifically interested, but I think there are some interesting elements. So let's start with Hannah Arendt. Hannah Arendt, who actually in her book goes into, you know, is interested in both Russia and Germany, and she describes what she calls a totalitarian system as a contradictory and an unstable political system in constant flux, trying to be faithful to its original utopian visions that had carried the movement, political movement, revolutionary movement, to victory, while at the same time establishing a government to rule over society and provide basic goods and services. So she's, she writes, the totalitarian ruler is confronted with a dual task, which at first appears contradictory to the point of absurdity. He must establish the fictitious world of the movement as a tangible working reality of everyday life, and he must, on the other hand, prevent this new world from developing a new stability. At any price, prevent normalization from reaching the point where a new way of life could develop. So what she's trying to explain here is that these are revolutionary movements that have very ambitious goals, and it is exactly this ambitious or even fictitious nature of their movement which makes it impossible to reach a final state. These systems or, or, gov or um, we can say regimes must be in constant motion, as they always have this goal that they can never really reach, but must pretend that they uh, strive for. So the, the totalitarian state is fundamentally, as he called it, structureless. He doesn't have a structure. He refuses also stability. He's neglecting material economic interests to give them priority. He's uh, also denying profit motives and pursuing non-utilitarian goals. So Arendt offers, I think, a complex understanding of totalitarianism that hinges on the inherent instability of a movement and the self-perceived lack of legitimacy, that's something very important, because these movements came to power not, not in any way by, by vote or they cannot rely on any legitimacy. Uh, now, very briefly, Carl Schmidt. Because Carl Schmidt is writing about a dictatorship, and he explains dictatorship in its most fundamental form as a state of exception, and in German it's Ausnahmezustand. So a dictatorship is never simply just a tyranny or despotism but a means to reach a certain end, which is either the defense of the existing order or the creation of a new order. It marks a stage of transition of power. The Marxist-Leninist concept of dictatorship of the proletariat falls exactly in this category of dictatorship, since it strives to build a new political order on society. So I know this is abstract, but if we bring it together, I think it provides us with a way of thinking about the PRC history. The elements of Schmidt and Harren's theories help us understand that under condition of a revolutionary and structurelessness state in a constant state of exceptions as a dictatorship, assertions of existential threats then are not only de defined and identified real vulnerabilities or threats, 
they become politically constitutive acts. So this is a regime, in other words, that will always, will always need to invoke external threats in order to keep the mobiliz mobilization going. It will always securitize the environment in order, again, to be able to use to invoke this state of reception. It will always reserve a state of exception, which will it always allow to resort to extraordinary means, including violent means, to deal with resistant to its system. So what we can see here is revolutionary struggle in the PRC, and you know in the PRC, especially in the early Mao period, but perhaps beyond that, I would say definitely beyond that, there was one campaign after another. It was really a government that tried to avoid any sort of stability. Whenever it was, whenever it reached a more stable state, another movement or campaign was just on the horizon. So revolutionary struggle or this period became tantamount to emergencies and exceptions and movements and campaigns and a constant of fear or fight against real or imagined enemies, since the new state saw itself constantly under siege and was distressed by anxieties about popular acceptance, security issues became overruling importance. It cannot trust the people, could not trust the people. This discourse caused the state to reimagine the people and groups in a way that pushed security concerns in the forefront and at the same time devalued notions of procedure and legality. It established powerful contexts to construct threats to the social body of the Chinese nation and as a result to produce new forms of political subjects. It allowed the CCP to maintain a dictatorial rule whereby the state of exception evolved into a lasting paradigm of government. It's always made clear, um, I would say in the 1950s and again beyond, that this state of exceptions can be invoked if seen necessary by the rulers. And mass campaigns, political movements targeted at enemies or corruption or whatever are de facto declarations of a temporary state of emergency because all the regular law, all the regular procedure is basically abolished for the time being of the campaign. So these conditions of structurelessness that means you know, a weak institutional structure, let's say so. Most, I think that would be more precise. And emergency created then a perversive, pervasive atmosphere of crisis and insecurity. And this was made worse by the lack of legitimacy that marked the rule of the CCP from the beginning. Following the definition of Mark Zuckman, I understand legitimacy as a generalized perception or assumption that the actions of an entity are desirable, proper, and appropriate. So I do not define legitimacy in a processual way, so that there's a certain process, like, for instance, voting or democracy. Legitimacy is not even specific. Rather, it needs to be generalized. Also, legitimacy is not a property or resource, but rather a condition reflecting that the entity is based on relevant rules, laws, normative support, alignment with a cultural framework. So it is a symbolic value which justifies the actions by s of an entity by giving a normative approval to practical imperatives. But that was that in since China, or the CCP, came to power by a victory on the battlefield and nothing else. It won on the battlefield. It won a military victory. It was always unsure or uncertain about this generalized perception or assumption that the actions of the CCP are desirable, proper, and appropri appropriate within socially constructed system of norms. It couldn't be sure, could never be sure. And this is, I think, one of the things that uh, haunts uh, the CCP until today. It can just not be sure how much support it has and if it has any legitimacy. This provides, I think, a framework for interpreting the history of the PRC as well as the challenges it is still facing, the profound impact of vulnerability, distress, security concerns, I think, exp 
it that shaped a society with a comparatively low or weak <coughs> degree of institutional structure. And I have two more arguments that I would like to make, and um, I think we will we'll be able to finish in time. One of the, and uh, the arguments that I now try to make is trying to demonstrate that this approach can help us understand certain phenomena in PRC China. It has, for instance, been suggested that violence and terror were essential elements in Mao's formula of rule. Moreover, the phenomena of labor camps and mass campaigns targeting large groups of the population as a manifestation of state violence convey the unmistakable message that Mao's regimes were spent on violence and mass murder. With the opening in the archives, more and more evidence has been produced in recent years or decades. But what, if anything, is captured by this notion of violence? What is to be gained from, histories, from the historization of violence? Of course, a history of violence and terror is only complete if not only revolution but also war is included in the story. And in 1949 was hardly a completely new beginning, separating the period of war and violence from a period of reconstruction and pure ideological conflict. The victory of the revolution 19. 49 was a climax of more than dec of decades of war, revolution, and violence. And we have seen the number until 1911, but if you see the number after 1911, it goes up quite dramatically. And most of it, I mean, if you, if you of course, include uh, Japan, is, it's no doubt that the 20th century is, is one of the bloodiest uh, centuries in Chinese history. So. Of course, we have to see that all this what happened after 49 happened in a country that was really scared by, by, by decades of violence. And the various wars that were fought on Chinese soil or along its borders should be seen all as manifestations of total warfare. I think the totality of it makes sense if we understand it in both practical and ideological terms as life and death struggles. And you see, that leads me, of course, to the state this issue of the state of exceptions. So this question of mass violence has to be placed within this context and tradition of total warfare uh, in China. So the socialist project was def designed to defend society against its enemies within. So discourses and practices of exclusion and exception allowed the state to enlist its own citizens to fight against the enemies, to police themselves, and to protect the socialist order. The question of loyalty or betrayal began to override concerns, all other concerns. So this discourse of struggle produced, of course, um, this persecutions, internments, but also justified the liquidation of those deemed uncorrectable and dangerous to socialism. So hence the notion that socialism must be defended, condoned almost a moral right to annihilate those outside. Based on Hannah Arendt, it would seem that the turn to this crushing force was a reflection of the weakness and fragility of CCP institutions rather than the result of total power. So there is a multi-causality and a multi-dimensionality of the violence in the PRC. And that makes it necessary that we have to broaden the field of inquiry. And the most important area of debate is not whether violence was employed or the number of victims, but the purpose of violence. And there was a clear need it is a clear need, I think, for proper contextualization and historization so as to avoid the simplistic impression that violence emerges only out of the arbitrary rule of dictatorship. In other words, what I want to highlight here is that there's first the question of the social embeddedness of violence. I mean, violence is not just inflicted top down. And second, the ideological imperative. So the key proposition is that violence, while mostly state-driven, was also embedded in Chinese society, was supported and inflicted by regular Chinese citizens upon each other. That is actually something that, especially in this repression, repression narrative, gets all too often forgotten. So is there a propensity for violence developed within Chinese society that made these outbursts of brutality possible? Second, I would also like to highlight another aspect of PRC history, 
beyond the Zweierlands um, that I think we can explain here. And that is especially how the society is shaped and changed in the 1950s and beyond. So the question here is where and how was this state imprinted on society after 1949? And these are the two ways um, the Chinese, uh, after 1949, the CCP used, or how can we say, uh, governed uh, China, one, by these violent campaigns, but the second is to really transform society. Timothy Mitchell has, used, has a useful concept here, the state effect the various kinds of work inquire to install the effect of an activist transformational sta state standing apart and above something called society. So we have to recognize that there is a fussy boundary between what we conventionally divide into state and society, asking about the distinction between the state apparatus on the one hand and a more diffuse state presence, awareness of the state, self-fashioning with state norms in mind on the other. So in the course of the 1950s, the state in China inscribed itself into societies in many ways, ceasing to be an external, peripheral presence. Instead, the state and the party sought to be embodied in many ways in a familiar neighbor, such as a woman leader, an activist, a labor model, a lay farm, <laughs> of course. So while earlier work mostly was interested in the social role of basic class categories, what is more fascinating and significant is the capacity of social classification to generate social realities rather than s uh, simply reflect them. And there are many instances, by the way, when, for instance, this category of worker you know, was applied in the 1950s in China and all of a sudden people found itself being labeled as workers who had never thought about themselves as workers. So ascribing class is one dimension of this process ascribing nation, ethnic, think about the 50 minorities, and so on, generating a new sense of Chinese was equally important. So just on the horizon of this kind of history, we can also discover that as much as the local in particular dominates, these social actors also partake in a wilder world that's partly made up of fantasies and projections, but partly also the product of transnational practices. So many of these, and there's been great research about this, many of these categories come, of course, from the outside, especially from Russia or the Soviet Union to China. So they point, several studies argue then that the regime intended to create a new collective subject, an entirely modern, illiberal, and self-fashioned personage. They point to the long intellectual tradition of imagining this kind of subject, the initiatives to create such personalities, and in an exemplary fashion, the kind of striking conversation, a uh, conversion experience that real persons underwent in becoming new men, the new people. While these labors of self-transformation differed in significant respects, the point is to highlight the ways in which the PSC was literally embodied in the lives of people, and that has produced a lasting imprint, I believe, on Chinese society. And it's very clear, many, many instances are available, that discipline and education were central in this project. And that's noteworthy because it also shows that, uh, these, uh, that uh, here these categories are, um, of course, also could also be with uh, coercion uh, transported. Let me come to a conclusion. So I try to reconsider the history of Revolutionary People's Republic of China by, by trying to explain or account for two very important dimensions, which I think need to be in any history of the PRC China. And while bits and pieces of the older master narratives remain very popular in our literature, the generalizations of those narratives, I think, have been eroded by recent research that pre presents the PRC as an extremely extraordinary, diverse, complex, but also volatile history. The PRC has inherited indisputably difficult circumstances from previous regimes. That's clear, bombed dikes, bombed cities, land-hungry peasants, refugee movements, and so on. 
It had expended an enormous amount of energy with varying degrees of success to re-educate, reconstruct, eradicate through means of coercion and persuasion a pre-existing world of capital and maritime connections. There were, before 1949, capitalists, Christians, Buddhists, liberal intellectuals, other followers of value of faith, whose successful reconstruction appeared to have long eluded the party and the state. To build a new China, again with various degrees of success, it had required an equally significant amount of investment in the form of cultural capital, political energy. New China inscribed itself onto society and everyday lives, but it also resorted to violence where the rulers believed it is necessary. So above all, under these conditions of uncertainty and anxiety, the party resorted to the state of exception to impose power won on the battlefield. So the critical decisions laying at the basis for the state of exceptions were all made under the influence of anxiety and vulnerability. The state of exception is therefore an umbrella term for the structuralist form of revolutionary dictatorship that gathers beneath in those emergency categories while emphasizing that this state has its, its defining characteristic that it transcends the border of the constitutional or the legal. In other words, that it faces and accepts no limits to its power. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>